Okay, um, I don't know what the, the numbers are like, but uh, hopefully people will be uh, sort of stepping in uh, now. So, uh, hello, my name's Rory Edmonds. Uh, I'm DataSite's uh, Sample Community Manager, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome you today as the moderator of this, uh, the third in the series of the, the Better Together webinars. So, uh, Crossref, DataSite, Sorry. and Orkey. Rory, yeah. might be worth just pausing for a few minutes. It looks like people are continuously right. studying in at the moment. <laughs> Right. Oh, okay. Okay. I was hoping someone would give me a nod of, of regard that. Okay. I'll start again in a sec. Yep. We've just hit 20 attendees. 20. Okay. Yeah. Let's I was see. hoping someone might keep me and keep an eye on the number and let me know whether I should go ahead or not. But yeah. All right. Maybe chop the beginning of that off <laughs> when you put it up online. I was just practice. Yeah. All right, I think it's slowed down now. Yep. Oh, wait, one more popped in, but it's definitely slowed down. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's let's begin then, and hopefully people can can catch up with us as they uh, as they join in. So let me start again. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name's Rory Edmonds. I'm Data Sites uh, Samples Community Manager, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you as the moderator of this, the third in the series of the, the Better Together webinars. So Crossref, Datasite and Orchid and now Ray have come together to collaborate on these webinars uh, that focus on the APAC community. And they have the aim to really deliver content and conversations that are relevant, interesting and useful to the stakeholders in the region. Now, before I begin, um, there are two quick matters to deal with. Uh, the first is a little bit of housekeeping so please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, say hello to people, who you are, where you're from, etc. But for any questions you have that come up during the presentations, please use the, the Q&A functionality. Um, and secondly, in a moment, we're going to begin with a few quick questions using Mentimeter. So hopefully you can see um, my screen. And at the top of there, you'll you'll notice uh, go to menti.com and use this code. So please, yes, go already. It's worth you starting to do this. If you could go into menti.com and enter the code 2782292. So okay, uh, while you're doing that, let me say a tiny bit more. Um, so the theme of this third webinar is metadata richness uh, completeness. Uh, metadata quality is obviously an important topic for many of us, and uh, during the webinar we'll hear from uh, Matthias Liffers from ARDC and representatives from Crossref, Datasite and Orchid, who will look at uh, the issue of metadata quality from various angles. Um, what does it mean to be rich or complete? Uh, how does it affect metadata capture and creation workflows? Um, how is this process supported? And so on and so forth. So um, before we hear from um, Matthias, let me conduct the first uh, Menti uh, set of questions. So why is that not moving? Hmm. Uh, why? Okay, let's try that way. No. Ah, there we go. So the first question, uh, what does rich uh, complete metadata mean to you? And we'll give everybody a moment just to type in a few responses. Once it slows down, we'll we'll move on to the next one. But I know it takes a moment for people to jump in and type. So At the moment, findability. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Ah, now they're coming in. Lovely. Okay, that seems to be slowing down a little bit. Oh, let's give it a second or two more. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Let's move on to the next question then. I think we've got a nice number of uh, things there for us to uh, look at. And then, so the next question, 
Um, okay, why is that not working? Ah, that way. What are the main challenges to creating richer metadata in your workflow? So again, I'll give everybody a few minutes to answer. So money, yeah, <laughs> on people, I suppose. <laughs> Too much effort, yeah. <laughs> Can guess that one coming up. Automation. Here we go. Lovely. All right. Again, I'll give it a tiny, tiny bit longer because typing in these longer sentences for the these answers takes a bit of time. Um, all right. I think that's probably it for that one. And then how much do you agree with the following statements? The benefit of generating and sharing richer metadata is clear to me. I know how to create and share rich and high quality metadata with the community. And the more comprehensive the metadata associated with an output is, the easier it is to be fair. So how much do you agree with these statements? OK, so at least the benefit is pretty good for everyone. And the one that's more difficult is knowing how to create and share rich high quality metadata with the community, which means that this talk is or this presentation set of presentations will hopefully be highly relevant to uh, to a lot of you. All right. So again, I think that's slowed down a little bit. So we'll move on. And so. Uh, we're going to start with uh, with our set of talks, so I will stop sharing my screen. Please keep Menti open because we will go back to Menti later on. So save you having to put everything in again. Just uh, just keep that open somewhere. But um, I will uh, stop sharing now because I am going to hand over to uh, Matthias Liffers. Um, so please let me quickly introduce Matthias. So Matthias helps Australian research organizations get the most out of national and international inf information infrastructure. Uh, he talks about data DOI so often that he has the DataCite 4.4 metadata scheme, uh, schema pinned in his web browser, apparently. Well, hopefully it'll be 4.5 very soon. So uh, Matthias, take it away. Sorry, that moment where you share your screen and suddenly the mute button vanishes and moves somewhere else. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Kaya, I would like to start my presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I work, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, acknowledging that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, I'd like to extend that respect to uh, all the First Nations people of Australia and any First Nations people in this presentation. So I did give Rory a rather tongue-in-cheek um, introduction to myself, um, realising I, I didn't want him to go on for too long. Um, but largely, uh, so I, I work at the Australian Research Data Services, and I'll introduce that organisation shortly. But my job is very much about persistent identifiers. Uh, the Australian Research Data Commons um, makes available to Australian research organisations, DOIs, handles, IGSNs, RAIDs, all sorts of different PIDs, uh, and my job is to make sure that they get the most out of them. Now, the um, Australian Research Data Commons is uh, a distributed organisation around Australia. There are probably 80 or 90 of us. Uh, I'm on the western side of the country in Perth. I've got lots of colleagues around the place in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, ever, Adelaide, everywhere. Um, and the ARDC, apart from persistent identifiers, also makes investments in data. 
and specifically makes investments in data that we think are of high value or the potential to be high value uh, and, and of uh, good use to other researchers, to secondary researchers. And so the program in particular that I'll be talking about fits within this National Data Assets Program, where uh, we, we do invest a lot of money um, on, on leading edge uh, data sets. The program in particular that I'm going to be talking about is the Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, also known as HASANDA. Now, I need to apologize in advance if I use too much jargon uh, or acronyms. My job is that there are too many acronyms and they just come out of my mouth before I even realize it. Um, so HASANDA, the, uh, the program, is about making research data from clinical trials more available, more findable, and hopefully more reusable and therefore provide more value to the people of Australia and in fact, around the world. Uh, now, if you're not familiar with the concept of a clinical trial, um, uh, it is a kind of research, um, you've, you've probably come across the idea before, clinical trial is, is the, the technical term. Uh, it's when you're trying out a new medical intervention, whether it's a treatment, whether it's a drug, uh, whether it's some kind of program, to help people be healthier. Um, so uh, they, they have vast, huge potential to save lives. And they're also incredibly expensive to run. Uh, and therefore, the, the data that arises from a clinical trial itself is also quite valuable because to regenerate that data would be just as expensive as to create it in the first place. Now, the other thing about clinical trials data is that it is incredibly sensitive. Um, it, it's amongst the most sensitive data that you can have when it comes to people's health and any health conditions. Um, and look, we certainly in Australia, we've recently had a problem with uh, breaches, data breaches. Um, my own health insurer was breached recently. So my personal medical information is currently available for download on the dark web if you know where to look for it. Uh, let me know if you find it. However, we want to share data safely um, and, and securely and with appropriate, um, the, uh, appropriate protection measures in place and therefore make sure it only gets shared with the right people, with the right secondary researchers. So currently, unfortunately, um, it's not common practice for clinical trials researchers to share their data in a systematic fashion with other researchers. Uh, it's all very ad hoc. Uh, a, a researcher would probably have their own practices on how to do it, if they do it at all, um, because we have um, the all sorts of pain points related to sharing data and, and even making the data findable. Um, so many clinical trials involve multiple organizational stakeholders, each with their own data governance structures, and, and the interactions between those structures can make it impossible for researchers to share data. There are no community agreed standards and practices to share that data. Um, many clinical trials research networks uh, don't even, un unfortunately, don't have the appropriate technology and systems to share that data because their technology and systems is designed around keeping data safe and secure and to not share it with anybody ever. So when you uh, are trying to take advantage of existing systems that have been designed to not share data, it gets very hard to actually share that data in a safe fashion. And finally, understandably, there are huge cultural gaps uh, with researchers and researchers organizations undertaking clinical trials, they aren't necessarily used to the idea of sharing data. And in fact, they've been trained their whole lives to keep this sensitive data safe and, and not share it at all. So what we're trying to do is to address some of these issues where we can uh, in collaboration with the clinical trials community in Australia. Um, so where uh, and now acknowledging that there already have been some efforts uh, and, and some work done in Australia to share clinical trials data, but it is quite ad hoc. 
It could be on a researcher by researcher basis or a, a clinical trials organization by organization basis. And there's not necessarily um, a holistic standard way for the entire country to address this problem. Now, I also need to acknowledge that I'm absolutely not the only person working on this program. Uh, I'm also, you know what, I'm not the most important person working on the program either. Uh, so there are um, many colleagues of mine at the ARDC who are running this program. And I was brought in as an expert on persistent identifiers and metadata. Um, and you'll see why my expertise uh, is, is coming in handy shortly. So um, Hassanda actually, the, the program started a couple of years ago, and it is not due to finish for at least another six months. Uh, we're currently aiming for a mid-2023 sort of unveiling of capability. We would like data sets from this program to be discoverable by third parties in the middle of next year. And we've invested six and a half million Australian dollars uh, over three years. We've, as I said, we started a couple of years ago, two years ago, extensive consultation and engagement with the clinical trials community. And we've been co-designing the infrastructure and the workflows to enable data sets to be discoverable. Um, so how has this gonna happen? Uh, I've got a few more diagrams to show you. Um, actually, I, I promise now I'm not gonna show you a metadata schema. Now, I know some people, I recognize some of the names in the attendees list, and I know I've got some real metadata enthusiasts here, but I don't want to um, necessarily scare everyone away by, by showing giant metadata schemata. So the idea is that across the entire, uh, uh, network um, of clinical trials organizations in Australia, we can establish some coherent data practices uh, uh, that feed into each of these nodes. Now, the Hassanda program consists of eight nodes that together represent over 80 organizations. And these 80 organizations all undertake clinical trials and they all have precious data and they're all interested in making that data discoverable. And, and so we're working together to develop these coherent data practices, but then what they have, trial information, data, and other documents, uh, all this stuff about clinical trials, is gonna be fed into a federated service hosted by the Australian Research Data Commons. Um, so the, the first step for finding data sets is a, a discovery service um, that, we're calling the Hassanda portal at this stage. And we also then will be implementing a data request and access management system, uh, sorry, a data access request management system, DARMS, that will let third parties find, uh, well, once they've found a data set they want, to submit a request to access that data. Um, you know what, we don't need to talk about the timeline. I'll just show that up very quickly. So when you see the video, you can pause on this slide and have a look at how things are, are panning at the moment. So we are around here, very late in the development phase, and we're hoping to start the testing and deployment next year. Now, in understanding uh, the needs of all the different uh, people involved in uh, collecting and, and sharing and finding research data, um, we need to understand all the different personas. Um, now, the, the, the people I'm really focusing on, to be honest, are these secondary researchers who are trying to find data that might already exist for a number of reasons. So they might be undertaking a systematic review. That is to say, they're trying to find lots of clinical trials about a similar kind of condition or, or, or medical treatment and write a review that provides some clinical guidelines that doctors can use. Uh, or another researcher might be trying to replicate or reproduce the results of an existing trial just to verify that the everything is okay. Uh, or finally, a researcher might want to take the data from an existing study for a completely different kind of research. And, and maybe they're investigating a gene and it's linked to multiple different health, um, uh, health conditions or, or who knows what, but they're trying to do something novel with the existing data. So um, what have we been doing? Or rather, what, what have I largely been doing? 
um, in, in designing the workflows and the way that metadata flows around, because really metadata is the key to making this system work, uh, is that we want to minimize data re-entry. We want to take advantage of existing data infrastructures or, or metadata infrastructures. And the point of all this is to provide secondary researchers with all the information that they need to make an informed decision as to whether or not they should submit a data request. We're not trying to enable a situation where somebody sees dozens of data sets available and just requests all of them. And who knows if you know they don't care if they're going to get access or not. We want to make sure that secondary researchers are given enough information to know, OK, if I request this data set, will the data set be useful for me? And what's the likelihood that my request will be granted? Now, the existing infrastructures that we'll be using in this first phase of Hassanda is uh, a system called ANZ-CTR, which is the Australian and New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry. It is a registry of most of the clinical trials that are undertaken in Australia, and it contains metadata about the trials. And we're also going to be leveraging data site metadata infrastructure, the, the DOI infrastructure, uh, to collect and gather the metadata on the data sets themselves. All right, and, and I will talk about how that's all going to come together and, and what exactly we're using from data site in this case. So uh, at a very high level, the idea is that the nodes, and so these are the clinical trial research organizations, eight nodes, 80 organizations, they, when they are undertaking a clinical trial, they register the clinical trial with ANZ-CTR, the Australian and New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry. They undertake the trial, they collect data, and then when their data is fit enough or in a good state to possibly be shared with third parties, they will then create metadata records and mint DOIs using data site. Now, the data, the metadata that they put into the data site record will have certain characteristics so that the ARDC central catalog can run regular harvests of data site metadata looking for particular keywords and particular characteristics. It then does the same with ANZ CTR, matches all the metadata together and provides a portal view of all the data sets of all the trials that the data has arisen from. Uh, a secondary researcher can search that central catalog. And then when they have found one or more data sets they're interested in, they can submit a request back to the node that the data came from. And then the node says yes or no. Uh, and if they do grant access to the data, they provide the access directly to the researcher. So we are dealing, the, uh, we, the Australian Research Data Commons, are dealing with metadata only. We are not providing infrastructure for secure data sharing. Uh, and, and we are relying on the nodes to have their own systems in place for secure data sharing. Uh, because each node will want to work in a different fashion with their own systems. Uh, and so we're not getting in the way of that where we're letting them um, decide for themselves how that will be done. Uh, how am I going for time? I think I've maybe got another five or 10 minutes. Um, so, um, you know what? I'm going to skip these workflow things. Um, so I, uh, I am adamant that when it comes to sensitive data, rich metadata is even more important than it is with open data because a data seeker can't just download the data set and have a look at it and work out whether the data inside the data set is valuable. They need to um, uh, be able to just from the metadata determine whether it's even worth their time to request access to the data because requesting access, having that request considered, and then getting access and downloading it and starting to work with it, that, that could take a very long time. It could take weeks or over a month, might have to go through a committee. Um, and so therefore there's a lot of energy invested in that request. So we've got to make sure that the metadata is rich enough to support uh, a considered decision. So how are we doing that? 
Um, so what I have written in conjunction with my colleagues and with the um, eight nodes, 80 organizations is what I call the Hassander metadata profile. The metadata profile um, lays out the information that we believe data seekers will need. And then it maps that information through to the data site 4.4 metadata schema and also the ANZ CTR metadata schema. And of course, since data site is one of the sponsors of this webinar, I'm going to focus a little more on the data site side of things rather than the ANZ CTR side of things. Okay. Um, now, the uh, to get a DOI and, and create a metadata record in data site, we need the mandatory six metadata fields. Um, and so Rory said, I keep the data site metadata schema pinned in my browser. It's always open. So I've memorized these six minimum fields that you need to provide to data site to even get a DOI in the first place. Um, interestingly, one of those fields is the DOI itself, um, which makes sense. We also need at least one creator. We need a title for that data set. We need a publisher. We need a publication year. And right now I'd like to ask data site, could we make that a full date rather than just a year? That would be great. Thank you very much. Happy to have a conversation about this in a different meeting. And you also need to provide a resource type. What is this thing you're minting a DOI for? Is it a data set? Is it software? Uh, with Hassander, it's always going to be a data set. So we take these six minimum metadata fields from data site. And to that, we have added some critical fields that we need to make the plumbing work to be able to match uh, the, the data site DOI with the appropriate record in ANZ CTR. Now, these are all uh, data site fields that we're using for a number of different purposes. So data site, very kindly, has a related identifier field, which is a great place to put an ANZ CETR trial identifier. So that is the unique identifier for the trial that is registered in ANZ CTR. We'd like to be a little more um, uh, specific. Actually, did I make a, sorry, I made a mistake in my previous slide. This is resource type general, not resource type. Um, then uh, a resource type slightly more specific than data set. We're talking about what the clinicians call an individual participant data, IPD. The Hassander metadata profile will change in the future because it has some limitations at the moment. And so what we would like is to, make, is to know which version of the metadata profile a particular data site record adheres to. And we also want to know to whom do we send data requests to? And so we're using the uh, contributor field in data site. Uh, there is a, I haven't quite memorized deeply enough, but there's an appropriate value for a contributor. Um, could be data custodian, I think. Then finally, to make things uh, better for searching and, and, and for science in general, for research in general, we really want our researchers, the nodes, the, the research organizations, to provide more metadata to help searching for particular data. So a subject, and that subject can come from MESH, the medical subject headings. It can come from the Australian and New Zealand uh, um, SRC fields of research. Um, it's not quite as good as MESH, but uh, we, we do like that here in Australia. We'd like to know some funding information for transparency. Uh, PICO, uh, here's a piece of jargon that is just about uh, medical research. Um, it describes who you're researching, what you're doing to them, what kind of medical in intervention, how you're testing whether the intervention has worked, and then what the outcome of that intervention is. And then other information as well. Um, I need to get moving along. Uh, and one very important thing here is we are trying something novel in trying to, using structured metadata, using Duo, the data use ontology, uh, to describe how that data might be reused. Now, Rory's just turned his video on, which is a very good sign for me to finish. So we do have some challenges, unfortunately. Um, and they we're working through all of them, but they don't aren't necessarily easy. And one key challenge, for example, is that 
vendors, people who, who provide software for managing data don't always make very good implementations of API usage. So vendors of data software haven't necessarily got a full implementation of the data side API. They just provide those minimum six fields and we want more than that. So we're trying to engage with vendors on that, uh, that part there. But you know what? I'll cut myself short right now. There's my details. Uh, feel free to get in touch and please subscribe to the ARDC newsletter. Oh, well, yeah, you could have gone on a couple of minutes longer, Matthias, but uh, if, if there's anything really pressing you want to tell people, I, I don't mind. Okay, lovely. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Matthias, for that. That was uh, really interesting. Um, as mentioned, please use the Q&A functionality if you have any questions for Matthias, as, uh, if you think of some as, you, uh, as we move along. We do have a little bit of time for discussion built into the the agenda, so um, we'll we we can go back to that later. But we we we're not going to have questions after every single presentation. So now we are going to very quickly go back to a couple more um, menti questions. Um, so I think if that one again. So hopefully you can see my screen and. So we'll go through the next set of, of few questions. Uh, again, if you're not already in Menti, go to menti.com and please use the code 27822292. Hopefully a number of you were already in from last time. So then what's the next question? Let's see if this works. There we go. How does your organization work with metadata so do you create metadata do you create uh, curate metadata do you harvest metadata do you use metadata as for your research do you use it as part of the, your reuse and i'll give everybody a few minutes And obviously this is multiple choice, so I see, because we've definitely got a lot more responses than we have people. So, <laughs> okay, um, just a tiny bit longer. Right, all right, let's move on to the next one then. Okay. Um, who in your organization can contribute to richer metadata? So, Please list anyone. I would, I assume, not by name, uh, but uh, their positions. Yeah, Matthias. <laughs> I don't know if you put that as yourself or not, but uh, it's a very good point. That wasn't me, but I think I know who put that there. <laughs> right, okay, we'll give it a tiny, tiny bit longer. Right, I think we can probably move on, but that's really good. And then, which organization do you want to learn uh, more about? So obviously this is without having had several of the presentations, but uh, do you want to learn more about Crossref, Datasite, ORCID or ARDC or multiple, I assume? Right. Okay. So Crossref is the winner, and that's probably good timing then. So I shall stop there. Um, and so again, uh, please keep Menti open because we do have one final set of questions. Um, but I shall stop sharing my screen um, so that uh, uh, Rebecca can uh, get start getting things set up. So Crossref was uh, was the, the as I said the winner there. Um, so actually our next presenter is uh, Patricia Feeney from Crossref. Now unfortunately 
Um, Pat Patricia can't join us live, so we have a video presentation. But let me just say a few words quickly about Patricia, um, and then we'll play it. So um, Patricia's role as head of metadata was created in 2018 to bring together all aspects of metadata, such as our strategy and overall vision, review and introduction of new content types, best practices, a best practice around inputs, uh, content registration, as well as outputs, representations through our APIs, uh, and consulting with the community about metadata. During her 10 years at Crossref, she's helped thousands of publishers understand how to record and distribute metadata for millions of scholarly items. She's also worked in various uh, publishing, scholarly publishing roles and as a systems librarian and cataloger. Okay, uh, please go ahead and play the video. Hi. I'm glad to be here. I'm Patricia Feeney, the head of metadata at Crossref, and I'm going to talk a bit about the importance of complete metadata. I think most of you are familiar with Crossref, but I'll go over some basics for those who aren't. We were founded in 2000, um, and at the time, our primary focus for many years was to facilitate persistent identifier registration and retrieval. Um, a big part of retrieval involves collecting metadata about the objects registered with us. Um, we're a membership organization consisting of publishers, funders, and organizations that create and impact scho scholarly communication. Our membership is international. We have over 20,000 members of various sorts, and they all register metadata and identifiers with us. But the metadata they register with us is evolving, especially recently, and that's what I'm going to talk about a bit. We currently provide support for a specific range of research objects. Lots of different kinds of publications can be registered, like journal articles, conference papers, books, reports, and standards. We also support registration of peer reviews, preprints, and other types of posted content. And as of a few years ago, we accept registration for grants from funding organizations. Our corpus is comprised mostly of articles and conference papers and books. But re more recently, supported content types are growing. Preprints are the fastest growing type of record. Peer review reports are also growing rapidly. And we're seeing a lot of uptake in grants as well. And we hope to really widen our support for different types of content in the future. So when they register content with us, our members supply us with a wide range of metadata. Basic metadata requirements include things like titles, authors, dates, ISSN, ISBN, identifying journals and books, anything that describes the content being registered. We also optionally collect a lot of non-bibliographic data. Um, this includes reference lists, funding data, ORCID IDs for contributors, affiliation information, including ROAR identifiers, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, uh, information about the relationship between items, um, information about whether content's been updated um, or retracted or corrected in some way. Um, so all of this metadata is increasingly essential. We have limited requirements for our members, but we're working with our membership to collect more of this rich metadata. We do ask our members to send us as much metadata as they can and that it be accurate, clean, and comp comprehensive. So the metadata registered with us is increasingly vast, and we're able to picture a new kind of vision for how we want to grow what we collect. We want to create a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. Uh, this is something we call the research nexus, and it goes beyond the basic idea of just having persistent identifiers for content objects and entities such as journal articles, book chapters, grants, preprints, data, software, statements, dissertations, protocols, affiliations, contributors, they should all be identified and that's very important, but it's also important to identify how they relate to each other and the context in which they make up the whole research ecosystem. So we've already enabled a lot of this with our members and we have records with references and data citations in particular. Um, 
we it's by no means comprehensive and really really need to build on that and work with our members to make it easier for them to send it to us and, and make them understand why they need to send it to us um, we also really need to grow relationships between items to make this research and access vision truly work each piece of metadata our members send to us enhances the scholarly record and helps with research integrity um, it can help provide signals about the trustworthiness of the work and by including provenance information such as who funded it you know connecting your grant identifier to a journal article is really powerful um, which organizations and people contributed to what whether something was updated or corrected and whether something was checked for originality using similarity check our metadata also helps with reproducibility uh, providing complete metadata allows um, relationships to be to be created between literature data software protocols methods and more and these can be used to reproduce research helping organizations such as universities funders and governments to track and demonstrate the outcomes of an investment is, is a really important step um, for metadata helping with reportment and reporting and assessment um, it also can help provide benchmarking information, show compliance with funder mandates, and help funders decide what other research to fund. Metadata, finally, of course, helps with discoverability. It's vital to discoverability. It helps people and systems identify work through multiple angle angles. Um, we encourage our members to send us abstracts and references in particular that's a that's a big step up for discoverability but we also need the basics like titles author information um and any kind of publication identifiers like ISSN and ISBN those are very important so one example of a service that is uh works fairly well and is entirely metadata powered is um, the ORCID auto update service. If an ORCID ID is supplied in a cross-ref record, we can, with the ORCID ID holder's consent, push details about their paper, preprint, or other work into the ORCID profile, which saves them the trouble of adding it themselves and makes sure the vital metadata like the DOI is included as well. So if you are a Crossref member or are curious about Crossref members and their metadata, we have something called a participation report. This tool helps members and others identify the areas where our members might need to improve upon what metadata they send to Crossref, and they can also verify what metadata they've sent to us. Um, a lot of our members use our own platforms or use third party organizations to send their metadata to us and it's a good way for them to just check and see that we're getting what they think they're sending to us um, rich metadata is so vital so we want to provide an easy way for our members to assess what they're sending to us and it, you can pull up information by member um, and by type of content and that'll break it down and tell you how how what percentage each metadata field is populated for um, certain content types like you can see which uh, journal articles have well you can't see which but you can see what percentage of journal articles have references what percentage have funder IDs what percentage have ORCID IDs which is really useful so our members send the metadata and by and large the metadata we send out to metadata users is provided for our members but we do do some things to curate lightly curate the metadata we insert funder identifiers into funding data if we find a good match we match DOIs to citations and reference lists if a relationship is provided to a cross ref DOI we include insert the recursive relationship into the other DOI's record. And we also, when we do these things, we record that Crossref asserted the relationship to preserve the provenance of who is providing and stewarding the metadata, which is very important. Um, we do this with a light touch, but it's these are important things that we feel like enhance the scholarly record down the road. So finally, we do have a large number of organizations that use our metadata. 
All of this use increases the reach of metadata records and content and helps solidify the research nexus. You know, a lot of archives, data centers, indexing services in particular use our metadata. And finally, if you want to use our metadata, we consider metadata to be facts, which in the United States means it doesn't need a license. So basically, all of our metadata is free to retrieve and use. Some pieces of metadata have been specifically released under a CC0 license. We do collect abstracts. So if remember, ops to send in an abstracts, they know it will be distributed openly, but is still ultimately subject to any copyright they have placed on it. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, we have a great support team that can help. We have comprehensive documentation. We also have a community forum. And of course, feel free to reach out to me with any questions you might have. Thank you. OK, so thank. Uh, obviously, we will send our thanks to um, Patricia. Uh, and uh, that sort of covered what I was going to say. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously, Patricia did put her put several places to uh, to contact. Um, otherwise, I uh, maybe uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, Rebecca can also ask answer some questions if you happen to have them. But again, if you do have any questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, uh, right, and uh, swiftly moving on. Um, our third presenter is uh, Paul uh, Vicant. Uh, Paul is Data Sites Outreach Manager, uh, contributing to the uh, DFG uh, funded projects, re 3 Data, uh, CoREF, Co um, and uh, ORCID uh, DE. Prior to Data Sites, uh, Paul worked for the Helmholtz Open Science Office and different universities where he was involved in building publication and data repositories. As a dedicated open science advocate, Paul strives to spread the idea of openness in scholarly communications, um, for example, by being a member of the DINI uh, Ele Electronic Publishing Working Group. Uh, so over to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rory. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me here. And then I'm really happy that uh, to see in the um, Mentimeter that um, lots of people are interested in what data set does. Um, yeah, feel free to um, mention us on uh, Mastodon. Um, yeah, I, I put my handle down in, in the corner as well as the data sites handle. Um, yeah, it's all about metadata, metadata enrichment, or uh, rather the question, who does the dishes? Uh, I'll get to back, uh, back to that later. Um, I wanted um, to give a short introduction to, to data set at the beginning, then talk about metadata, right, like basics, and, and then get into the schema. I will show some XML, but only a little um, in contrast to Matthias. Uh, yeah, then I will be talking about enrichment or who, who actually does the job. And um, also at the end, uh, I will be talking about our community. So DataSite is a non, uh, global nonprofit membership organization, and we work together with uh, over 2,700 2, uh, repositories uh, that belong to 200, more than 280 uh, members distributed uh, across the globe uh, with more than uh, 36 million DUIs. And as you can see, <clears throat> the um, the research outputs that you can assign DUIs to, um, they get connected. Um, they then can be discoverable and then easy to track in contrast to research outputs that do, do not have a persistent identifier, such as a DOI. So coming to <coughs> metadata and the metadata schema is to start with metadata is the data that provides information about something else. So it's not um, the content of the data, but the data about the data. So the metadata helps us to understand the structure, nature, and context of the data. So we as data site, we store this metadata. And as this is the topic today, it's more um, the more the merrier. And uh, since, <clears throat> since uh, yeah, we need to have structured and standardized metadata in order to, to be interoperable, um, we have a metadata site metadata schema that was uh, already mentioned by Matthias. Uh, the latest version is 4.4. Um, we will be we are currently working on 
uh, it is updated uh, frequently, like uh, every one or two years. And yeah, it, it consists of 20 metadata properties. Um, some of them uh, mandatory, um, some of them re uh, recommended, but <coughs> also some of them optional. Um, most, some of them can be repeated and some have control lists. I won't go into all the details of it uh, since Matthias covered already the mandatory type prop properties. Uh, here's an overview of <clears throat> which are recommended, optional, and mandatory. And just to show you this tiny bit of um, XML is uh, how how the metadata looks like in uh, uh, with data sign. So um, I'd rather stress the point of uh, the uh, the resource types uh, since we assign DOIs to many more resource types than just uh, research data. <laughs> we recently, with the last version, for instance, introduced output management plan, um, books, um, yeah, software. So many more um, resources can be described through the data set metadata schema, schema than just a research data. Um, then we have also the related identifier, <coughs> sorry, uh, that is used to, uh, for uh, identifiers to, of related resources. And as you can see, I won't mention all of them, but you can see these various re uh, relation types that can describe the relation between two resources is really important in terms of making connections between um, research entities. And um, it's not about, again, it's not only about da uh, data sets, but it's also about uh, software, <coughs> um, journal articles, um, and as you, yeah, you may choose from, from this list of research, uh, relations types. And as you can see with the, with the uh, related identifier types, we also cover um, these, or you can cover connections to um, many other um, persistent identifiers or identifiers that are in the field. So these relations are really important in order to make to 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 um, yeah get the full potential of PIDs uh, when it comes to um, um, finding out or, or reusing, reusing the metadata. And now discussing <coughs> metadata completeness. Um, uh, I'm lending uh, a diagram from Dorothea Strecker from Humboldt University in Berlin, who did a short uh, analysis of, of the completeness of these uh, actual uh, properties. And as you can see, and it would be surprising if it was not 100%, but um, all the mandatory fields are, um, yeah, reached the, the threshold of 100%. And as you can see, and that's why I'm delighted that Matthias within his talk uh, said that they were requiring, for instance, description as as a property, um, so that this um, these number are rising because uh, as you can see, there's a long tail uh, within the recommended properties, but also with the pro within the optional properties. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of metadata um, completeness, and the question is. Um, um, who does the job? And it's it's interesting to see what you responded in in the Mentimeter. We did the a similar question in the last open hours data set open hours and asked the question: Who is responsible for enriching metadata? And um, as you can see, uh, the responses were similar. Like everybody was pointing to the other one, like researchers, data curators, all librarians uh, were pointing the fingers to to the other two. Um, and then we also asked the question, slightly different, but who is actually enriching metadata? So who does the job? So it, I, I could have put Matthias there. So um, data curators or librarians um, um, depicted themselves as, as the ones doing the job. But <coughs> it also takes, takes us as an open infrastructure to, to make this happen, to, to um, yeah, be on the, on the road towards a richer world of metadata. Uh, and we don't do that only with the with the infrastructure that we provide, but rather also through initiatives and projects that we we are involved in. So we have the the Fair Workflows project, uh, in which my colleague uh, Chao Li Chen, who is also on this call, um, is working in order to make uh, fairness not only a buzzword but also um, give it um, some meaning by uh, accompanying. Um, Neuroscientists from the beginning of their research uh, throughout the research lifecycle um, to to make make research fair 
uh, and and really um, yeah accompany them and, and guide them through this process um, of metadata data cre uh, creation and curation. <laughs> the IGSN project or initiative that um, we have within DataSite, we are partnering with IGSN EV. Uh, Rory Edmonds is part of this as a community manager, as well as uh, Kobe Ross uh, from DataSite. Um, they're, they're working together with the, the IGSN community in order to make um, um, PIDs for, for, um, for samples a reality. Uh, me, myself, I'm also working in an NFDI for Inc. project, which is um, a project that focuses on the engineering sciences in order to, to find, uh, to create um, dashboards uh, that shows the links and, and the data, um, the data reuse re via event data and the pit graph that is the service by, by data site. And that, this is just to show you how many and how many domains and projects we're involved in in order to make metadata richness and completeness uh, um, a reality. And again, the buzzword also to be fair is um, that we're not, we're not only involved in these projects, but rather from a point of view of um, providing the means to, to be able to have uh, rich metadata is that we have a metadata schema that is really uh, comprehensive, but it <laughs> hasn't been so uh, right from the beginning, as you can see, with a version 2.1. This is uh, uh, an illustration that was made by Ted Haberman um, from Metadata Game Changers. And it really illustrates how, how there is an evolution of, of our schema and how this also supports uh, fair, the FAIR principles within our schema. So I'm not going into details. You can look it up later, but it really shows that we, we take care of, of metadata, of, of providing metadata um, or the, the, the room for metadata that you can fill out. Now, this leads me <laughs> to the community because again, um, the question is uh, who does the dishes? And again, we are asking ourselves, what was the goal again of, of, of metadata enrichment? And it is to make research outputs and resources discoverable and usable in the future as, um, as Matthias has already put it um, and, and Patricia as well. And actually, it takes all of us. It's not like with a Spider-Man pointing the fingers fingers at each other. It takes more than them only. But it, uh, on various levels, it involves um, different stakeholders to make make this a reality. So the first one is um, to to it's actually us as data site, uh, Orchid, Crossref, RAID, uh, ARDC, that we provide open in infrastructure to make this possible and. Uh, in this sense, um, we adhere to the principles of uh, open scholarly infrastructure policy to make this really happen. This is the 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 part that we are doing. And as you can see, <coughs> with the with the infrastructure that we provide, that we need to have interfaces that that make it easy to work with. Um, this this would be then the dishwasher, and to to stay within that allegory, um, that the services such as Fabrica that we have. Are working and also as uh, the point that Matthias made about vendors, we are also working. We have a service data site uh, registered service providers program, with uh, where we work with um, service providers with um, um, vendors or platform owners who want to, um, yeah, promote their uh, our standards best practices within their services. Um, then the community as such, like all of us. So it's it's um, collaborators and members of of um, of the data set community, but also policymakers and integrators, together with uh, the repositories um, that there are. And at the end, we should make it rewarding. We, we should um, um, maybe reframe it from a point of view so that researchers really get the idea of why metadata enrichment is really needed. Um, maybe these with these kind of terms of academic search engine optimization that would really um, make them understand that this more metadata means that their uh, that their discoverability um, increases, as well as uh, for them as for their uh, organization. Um, and just to end with this, we have <coughs> this is the promotional part of my presentation. We have an upcoming webinar on December eighth. Um, it's all about samples, not only about geosamples, but um, yeah, an introduction and, and uh, webinar of 
uh, about um, sample types, um, please, please feel free to join this, this um, webinar. Um, I guess the link will be in the chat. And the um, other event that we want to promote is the Dataset Connect Gothenburg, that it's co-located with the RDA plenary meeting in March. Um, so feel free to sign up now. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. I was just getting to the point of going to say, you please wrap up. And then you, you stuck a picture of me on the screen and promoted my webinar. So I, I stopped myself. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so now for our uh, final presenter of the day, it's uh, Estelle Cheng. And Estelle is the engagement manager for Global Direct at ORCID. Uh, she supports and engages with ORCID direct members, publishers, and services and vendors. Uh, based in Taiwan, Estelle works collaborati collaboratively with communities to promote adoption of ORCID, to establish communities of practice, and to drive more platforms or products supporting ORCID. Before joining ORCID, Estelle served as the product manager for digital object identifier DOI at uh, Ariti. Ariti? I'm sorry if I can't pronounce that correctly. <laughs> Please go ahead, Estelle. Thank you, Rory, and thank you, all the speakers. And hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And through the previous survey, I assume that uh, some or larger part of the audience know something about ORCID. And I hope my presentation today can share a bit more different um, thoughts on different information, especially in terms of, of metadata. I'm aware uh, this thing may not be a frequent thing from ORCID side. So I do hope that everybody can learn a bit of new stuff from my presentation today. And I'm going to share my, uh, start my video for better internet connections. And I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Let me start presenting. I hope yeah, so. we can see. Yes, perfect. Yeah. But yes. So, <laughs> yes, thank you, Rory. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, let me just stop, uh, start um, my presentation today. So, it's really from Orchid side uh, to share a bit more about how persistent identifier bits and how open infrastructure providers can work together to improve metadata quality. And uh, I want to start, why it's not moving? <laughs> so, sorry, my presentation is not moving. Okay, here you go. Okay, uh, I still want to start by uh, share a little bit more about ORCID for those who are new to ORCID. So ORCID is an independent non-profit organization registered in the US and we are open to participation from all um, everyone in the research community and it's launched in 2012 and we are sustained by fees from our member organizations and we are guided by our values and the funding principles. And ORCID is a community governed organization by a board of directors that are elected from our member organizations. And speaking of community, now it's, uh, we are still in the process, but good now that we have reached a critical mass of global participation. So we have about over a thousand member organizations globally in different countries. And we have quite a lot of active ORCID uh, records that are used by different researchers. And we have uh, a different national council share as well. And there are different systems and platforms that are using ORCID in the research workflow, as you can tell from this um, slide. And ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor I, I didn't, uh, Open Researchers and Contributor IDs provide three main services. The first is the ORCID ID. It's a unique persistent ID free of charge for researchers and for people who contribute to research. And we provide um, APIs for organizations to integrate or to adopt. And researchers, once they have an ORCID ID, they can share their ORCID IDs with those different organizations during research workflows. And then organizations can exchange interoper 
interoperable research information across systems, across platforms. An org is a place to store and share those different uh, resulting connections between ideas, people, and between research activities and affiliations. And I would like to, uh, to from here, to focus on our thing today about much data. So uh, as I think now all knows that org is the pit for researchers. And we, if we only have a string of symbols as identifier, that's not really helpful. So it is the associated metadata and the connections among metadata that are meaningful. The uh, the associated record, which we all know, OK records, or sometimes called profile, store those different automatic links to all of researchers' research, and links to those uh, links to all of your research with you as well. So you, as you can see from the right hand side, is a screenshot of an OK record. And to demonstrate a bit more in more detail, so uh, this is uh, researcher Sophia, and we will use this slide to demonstrate ORCID three, uh, service, three main service offerings. So please imagine Sophia is a researcher uh, at your research institution, and Sophia can directly went to the ORCID website to register for our ID with about one minute, I believe. And you can see on the uh, screen, this is her ORCID ID here. And under Sophia's ORCID ID, unique ORCID ID, and this is her record. And you can see there are different parts of section or probably metadata here. And there are different parts. You can see activities and like employment and works and peer reviews. So it's not about her um, publication history. It's really about the her research uh, profile, the overall all related journey of Sophia in terms of her research career. And uh, to be more specific, so you can see uh, about different person metadata, like her name, and different links to her person centric profiles. This is. And next section is about, as I said, ORCID is a place to store those connections. So we see people and now we see organizations. We work with different uh, PITS providers like DataSite or different infrastructure providers like Crossref. And uh, of course, we work with organizational ID providers as well. So this is the part of different organization metadata and organization links. And as you see the registry, the role of here is about organizational pits. And uh, this uh, slide is about works. So we work with, of course, course from that very closely. So you can see work uh, pits means DOIs here. And of course, there may be different kinds of work pits as well. And this is the work data data and work century links, uh, meaning like ISIN or different kinds of identifier uh, build links. And uh, in short, then open pits provide open persistent identifiers, enable infrastructure to connect both researchers, research affiliations, and research outputs. And in particular, I want to share that we associate researchers with institutions and with research outputs. So we work with uh, like research outputs for cross reference data side and even uh, grant grants or funding persistent identifiers and even for grower. So by this, the next, oh, sorry. The next is really about uh, in each different persistent, ident persistent identifier providers. We have different kinds of metadata about our primary object. And we also have different metadata about different linked objects. So this is the chart. This to, to demonstrate what, what I'm going to share. So ORCID, our primary object is people, and for CrossFit data side is about out research outputs, but maybe a, little, a bit different. And we also have ROWER for about research organizations. And as you can see here, um, each of us focus on 
uh, improving or holding definite authoritative metadata for our primary objects. Like for people, it's about people's attributes, like name, name different types of names, etc. And for works, that could be like title source, as we can see from the previous slides. And for research organizations, they've been like address, address or website. And the secondary or linked object is uh, those that uh, are related to our primary metadata object. And uh, we we are advocating that um, though for those secondary linked objects metadata, those should be regenerated from authoritative sources, like from the source like for works or for research data or publications that should be directly uh, linked or pushed by uh, the main source providers instead of ORCID, because sometimes we will get questions like um, why that is missing in ORCID's metadata schema. And uh, the position we are taking is that we are not the authoritative re uh, source. That's why it's better we work with them instead of Orky just trying to reinvent those. And next slide. <laughs> okay, it's moving. Okay, yeah. And a very short catch up is or summary, summary that we can improve. Uh, metadata quality by ensuring that PIDs are assigned to research objects and that the metadata deposit with the primary PID provider for the object is complete and accurate. Like uh, for ORCID, we are striving to improve the port of person metadata and we work with different um, different PIDs providers for those what we call secondary object metadata. And uh, to ensure those different links uh, between different persistent pits are accurate and consistent. And being thoughtful about where to store those authoritative metadata and when to kind of uh, catch or have them rather than duplicate copies everywhere. And it's a good sign that more we are working closely in the community with different PIDs providers or infrastructure providers to make it easier to access consistent metadata across different services, no matter your preferred point of access. And last but not least, I think that it's a good um, time to advocate this notion that we actually don't need copies of metadata everywhere. It's not that we don't need to store or we don't need to create metadata everywhere, but more like we need to have a good mechanism to link and use those data, uh, those those pieces to really link to metadata we want and to improve the quality. So I'm happy to learn your discussion and feedback. And here are some slides. Yeah, you can re always reach out to me through my work email and we have some links on ORCID's website. So that's a short presentation today. Hope I can provide a different perspective. I'm going to stop sharing now and I saw the risk face. Hopefully it's a good timing. <laughs> it is, yes, yes. Yeah, Thank so it's you. no problem at all. Thank you so much, Estelle. So now we have a little bit of time for um, Q&A and I noticed there were some questions and I know they've already been they're being answered by colleagues, but um, I might still go through them anyway, because I think it's useful if there's any con extra context that uh, people want to add to those um, and people may not have, have, have necessarily seen them. Um, so uh, the first one was to um, Mateus. Um, according to the workflow described, the DOI is assigned not directly to the registration of the study, but to the trial data outputs of the trial. In this case, how is the reporting of the trial data enforced? Is this part of the grant reporting requirements? So you've, you've obviously put an answer there, but I wondered if you wanted to sort of expand on that or um, sort of make let everybody know a bit more about it. Yeah, so uh, in, in Australia, clinical trial, so legislation requires clinical trials to be registered in one of a number of clinical trials registries, and CTI is one of them, and that's the one we're choosing to focus on for this phase of Hassander. 
Uh, we do hope to uh, include other clinical trials registries in future, but we just wanted to avoid scope creep and make sure that the first phase was something we could do and was manageable. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. So then the next one uh, was to Crossref and DataCite, and I see that Paul's given an answer, but I don't know if, again, if um, Rebecca has anything else to add to this or Paul wants to expand on it, but it was uh, to Crossref DataCite. One step is the enabling of metadata additions. However, the tough step is the uptake, which requires the change of internal workflows of the members and an overall cultural change. What are you doing for the, up, uh, for the uptake by the members? Yeah, I might, I might elaborate a little bit on, 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 on what I've written already in, in, in the chat. Um, so we, we as, as data side have different different approaches or take different approaches to that uh, to, to foster adoption. Uh, first of all, we, as I said, or tried to point out um, by providing a metadata schema that is not only created by ourselves or developed by ourselves, but we create, a, create that in accordance with the community. So that the standards that are created are not like really uh, focusing on, of, on what we want as an open infrastructure, but rather uh, it, 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 the the community that really demands for for changes that that um, can then be more easily implemented by by institutions of the community. So this is the part where we where we work on the the infrastructure um, or providing the the means um, to to um, Create metadata in a in a more coherent way, um, and then practically on on adoption, we we ha hold regular virtual events or in, in the future also in person events where we focus on best practices and and trainings and and give our members or uh, other stakeholders of our community the the um, yeah tutorials and 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 uh, means to to uh, fulfill our metadata schema um yeah this is what we do on, on behalf of data site thank you paul and i should mention that those first two were from uh, anonymous attendees so i um, i can't uh, acknowledge who who uh, asked the questions but the third question which again uh paul has answered and shaoli added a little bit but i don't know if shaoli we can uh, allow Shaoli to speak easily, but um, it was basically from uh, Daryl uh, Grenz and to Paul, what are DataCite and Crossref doing to align their metadata schemas? Um, so I don't know again if... Um... Yeah, may, may, may I start and then, then Rubika might, might take over. Um, yeah. Since like uh, Crossref and, and DataCite um, developed organically from different points of view, uh, with us starting from research data sets, um, both schemas are um, different in nature and had, had different starting points. Um, and so it's really difficult to align them like at this point right now, but it's, it's more about, and this is how how um, um, Kelly stated this, who, who is on behalf of data site um, um, responsible for, for uh, the metadata working group and the, metadata, the development of the met, our metadata schema is that we put uh that we align the relationship metadata so the relation types um to make um to make these connections between um different entities that are described either by the cross met metadata schema or the data side metadata schema so we are working on that to get these connections done Rebecca would you like to add a little bit more Yes, so uh, Crossref and data sites, so it's not just about uh, getting a DOI. So both of us have expertise and sur services that support and en enhance the specific needs uh, of our community and how they work with their content. So uh, you can uh, join in both. So we are also working with the increasing uh, number of organizations who have a content types that are best served by being members of both organizations. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And again, uh, a data site Crossref, 
Um, if you had to convince a researcher to take the time effort to enter more complete metadata, what pieces of uh, research evidence of impact would you show them that their time would be well spent? And Paul, you've added a, a link there. If you do you want to mention it to uh, yeah. people? Um, yeah, I added this link because um, as I put it in my presentation, it's really, I've been working now within open science or the field of open access and open science for 10 years now. And it's really difficult to convince researchers of such a dry topic, such as metadata and what kind of impact it has on their research. And so there are various studies that that uh, prove um, the, the, uh, the value of of publishing open access and, and adding more uh, more metadata. But maybe it, it's us as open infrastructures to change the way we frame it uh, in terms of what, what researchers might like um, be more able to, to um, grasp as an idea of search engine optimization so that um, when people are actually looking up things or research on the web, to, to make them understand that this is how they rank higher in terms of, of visibility on, on the on the list of, of either Google Scholar, Scholar uh, any other um, any other database that they're looking um, um, research up. So so this is really a point of, from my perspective, a point of, of framing things. And um, yeah, th there's just one one uh, study that I put in the chat. And yeah, I think I think it would be worthwhile trying it because I, as I see it, researchers see see it often as a burden to which it is like who does the dishes um, to create this metadata. Um, but it's also like they they are the ones who really benefit from it, and it's, it, it's also um, they may they they are the best um, people to. To describe their their research outputs, um, obviously we have data curators um, and librarians, but they are the ones who, who know best, like how how their research outputs are described. Thank you, Paul. And yet um, another one, um, which um, it must be ridiculous time in the morning for uh, Kelly. <laughs> that is what Kelly. Her, uh, they have put a, a response in, but um, data site Crawford some time ago. There was a discussion that Dataset and Crossref are working on uniform metadata access via DOI. This would greatly facilitate metadata enrichment by Scolix. Is there such an initiative? If so, what is the status? So Kelly has added about um, that, that uh, the, uh, again, unfortunately, this is someone who's anonymous, but uh, the person may be thinking about DOI content negotiation and added a, a link um, that uh, maybe is helpful. Um, again, I don't know, Paul or Rabika, if you want to add anything more to that. Um, yeah, as I'm not sure, like um, Kelly already put, put our response there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm imagining Kelly might have a, a, a better um, understanding of that. Um, but Rabika, do you have anything to add? Or No, I don't have anything to add. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, and then um, Henry uh, uh, is uh, uh, sorry, Henry. I, I, my mind is is beginning to wander a little bit. Uh, Henry Re uh, Re Zeppa, Re Zeppa? Re I'm so sorry. I can't can never remember how to pronounce your surname easily. Um, Current problem is uh, that Crossref do not include uh, data, site, data citations in their bibliographic metadata. Is this coming? And if so, when? So does anybody have a... So maybe Rabika, do you have a... I'm not sure I'm capable to answer this question, but... So far, we don't know yet. Right, okay. So maybe that's one to send to um, Patricia. Yes. Oh, okay. Henry has also asked Patricia. For, okay, that's probably a, a, a good thing, Henry. So thank you for that. Um, and that I think is, oh, wait a minute. One last very quick one, because I think we need to go to move to the wrap up. Um, 
So Joachim Philipson, uh, although being an ardent data site user and fan, what about using also schema.org um, and bioschemas.org for findability on the net? Um, does anybody want to yeah, provide maybe, a response for that? Maybe on that, um, within the context of the project that I just mentioned, mti 4 in um, there's also one task to to do a mapping between our data site metadata schema and schema.org. Um, we're currently working on that um, together, like uh, Kelly and and me and Cody. Um, we are working on this mapping. There is already a mapping from schema.org to data site, um, which has been done earlier by some other folks. Um, and and yes, th there is there is such a mapping already. Um, well, at least in that direction, but we are working on that um, for the um, data site schema work direction. Um, and I can mention, um, I'm having the beginning discussions with uh, bioschemas.org folk in the coming days. So maybe that's something that we can answer further down the line, but um, it's, it's, I think, um, not not a discussion we've really had at this moment. And I, I unless other colleagues have have uh, had that discussion, um, but it's certainly one that I'm beginning, um, certainly from the samples point of view. Okay, um, so I think that gives us just, just enough time to um, wrap up. So let me share my screen again. Um, let's, um, here we go. Right. Okay. So back to the Mentimeter. So hopefully, again, most of you are logged in uh, already. If you're not, please go to menti.com and add the code 27822292. And what we're going to have here is uh, the final set of questions, really repeating some of the ones you've already answered so that we can have a comparison of uh, your perceptions, see if they've changed, if they're better, uh, based upon what you've seen and heard today. So uh, let me click this correctly. So uh, back to this one, how much do you agree with the following statements? Um, the benefit of generating and sharing richer metadata is clear to me. I know how to create and share rich and high quality metadata with the community. The more comprehensive the metadata associated with an output is, the easier it is to be fair. So how much do you agree with those statements? So we've definitely got an up turn with the first and the third. Ooh, and I think the second one is higher as well. Let's give it a people a couple of seconds longer. Okay, it looks like that's uh, all we're going to get. Right. Um, this one's a bit different. Would you like to join a follow up webinar to deep dive on any of the topics touched on today um, and put in the specific topics if you have specific topics? I'm pretty sure yes or no is probably a reasonable answer as well, but we'd really like the topics if you have very specific topics you'd like in a deep dive follow up webinar. Uh, give everybody, okay, no, no response. Ah, yes, at least one person's interested. All right, um, give everybody a second, because this is obviously a bit more of an involved answer. Okay, I think that's stopped. So then the very final Crossref data site, ORCID, RAID, R, um, infrastructure I can benefit from, services I can purchase, communities I can join, projects I can contribute to. So again, a little bit of a different framing of the question, but uh, I think again, it's sort of 
how much you understand about these organizations. Now that you've heard a bit more. Okay, um, that seems to be slowing down a little bit. So I think I think we've done. So thank you very much, everyone. So um, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Um, we really hope you found the webinar useful. Um, the slides and the recording will be shared with you um, soon. Um, and please keep an eye on our various communications channels for the next in this webinar series. Um, so we look forward to seeing you again. Um, thanks, thanks to the panelists again. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone.